Hi, I'm Pastor Matt, and I'm here to talk about my wife, Becky. Uh, we've been married for 21 years. My name is Margaret Purvis. I am the oldest redheaded child of Pastor Alan Terry Purvis and Becky Watson's big sister. The thing I love most about her, if I was to boil it down, I would say uh, from the, even the beginning, she's a worshiper, and that worshiping heart really uh, translates into her work, her music, and her life, and everything flows from that, and I've been blessed by it. She's got this spirit of excellence that is very diligent, very hardworking, creative, able to do quite a lot of things. I really like pranking Uncle Matt with her. I also like to prank other people with her, but Uncle Matt is my favorite target, and I like that she always hangs out with me. She has generated heart to spend time with people and if uh, some people in ministry they have a difficult time she will spend time that is a love about her and she a great leader in our ministry this tribe victory asia would not be the same without her grit without her integrity without the standard to honor and the standard to excellent and the heart for the father and the heart for the kingdom of god that she brings everywhere she goes she has lots and lots and lots of insight and wisdom and you know i really look up to that that she's the same uh, when she's home and as she's when she's at work i'm not saying she doesn't have bad days and good days but uh, overall she is the same person everywhere i um love you auntie becky and i want to be just like you when i grow up my niece those kids they have my heart you know and if you didn't know that, just watch uh, Zoe. <laughs> it's so obvious. Thank you, Jesus. Well, you know, I had so many things that I felt like I wanted to share. And then as I was preparing in the end, I just kind of felt like, you know, so many ideas in my head, I didn't really know where to go with it. I had like 15 thousand <laughs> messages you know trying to cram it into one and it's like not working and then I just felt like the Lord just speak to me and say you know just talk about the thing that you know how to do and I'm like okay like what do you mean the thing that I know how to do like worship administration like you know what are you talking about and I just felt like the Lord said talk about how to be a son or a daughter because that's something that you know how to do and I think sometimes we feel like it's a little bit complicated or unclear. You know, the people that we're leading, how do we know if they're our spiritual son and our spiritual daughter? As a son and a daughter, how do we know that we're actually tied to the vision? Like, we, we feel like we love our family, right? We honor our leaders. But sometimes it just feels like, how do I know I'm actually positioned in the right place? Because none of us want to miss out on what it is that God wants to do in us and through us, amen? And nobody ever thinks that they're going to be the one that ends up, you know, offended, disillusioned. You don't think you're going to be the one that's going to break relationship, right? You're always going to be the person that's going to do it right because that's your heart towards God. But one of the things that I've learned in my relationship with God and my relationship with others is that Anything something is wrong anytime something is wrong in my own heart It doesn't actually show up in my worship first It doesn't show up in my relationship with God first The first place that it manifests is in my relationship with other people And a lot of times because our relationship with God is good. We assume That the other stuff is okay Right. It's amazing to me that King Saul was able to sacrifice and he was able to reason in his mind, right, when he was supposed to wait for Samuel, and he didn't wait, that he was actually doing the right thing. He was doing the righteous thing. But in that moment, he was actually dishonoring Samuel because he was disobeying. Samuel said, the prophet Samuel said, wait for me, right? So before I get into my preaching, I have an excerpt from a book that I want to read. Please bear with me. Um... It's a newly published book. I don't know if anybody else has read this leadership book yet, but I'm just going to read part of the book, and then we'll go from there. It says, We lead through relationship rather than position. Tenant number eight is the favorite tenant in Victory Asia because it's how God has designed the kingdom to operate. We are committed to increase as opposed to maintenance. Tenant number nine. 
because increase comes through spiritual sons and daughters, and blessing and inheritance are passed down from generation to generation, right? That's where the increase comes from. God is the author of Victory Churches, tenant number one, because God has authored us into this family. He's placed us into this family. People are the focus of our ministry, not projects, tenant number five, because my ministry is you, not the resources and the influence I'm amassing. Here's the point. We can never stop working through covenant relationships. As we grow and continue the process of passing the baton, we need to be more intentional than ever in deepening our relationships because covenant relationships are the not-so-secret superpower of Victory Asia. Do you remember King Saul? He ended up with a messed-up agenda because he stopped working through relationships. He decided he didn't need to wait for Samuel because he was in a hurry to move things ahead. Who needed the old guy anyways when he could do it himself? And instead of valuing David, he made David his personal enemy. How did Saul get it so wrong? He messed up his relationships with the prophet Samuel, with David, with his son Jonathan, with the nation he was leading, and with God. It's inevitable that things will change as we grow, and how we do things are going to change. But what can never change is how we work through covenant relationships, through the teaching, impartation, prophetic insight, apostolic direction, and advice we receive from the family. Because our future is as strong as our relationships. Amen? So this amazing book is actually your book. <laughs> this is our Young Lions book. And we asked for the notes from uh, our speakers before they uh, shared for Summit, and we actually compiled it and put it together in a book form for you. So this is going to be your gift today as you leave the sanctuary. <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> and uh, I, I love the minimalist cover, you know. People don't know what it's about. It's like a secret until you open it, so it's going to be good. But that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the strength of our relationships. And <clears throat> if we have the wrong idea of how the blessing is transferred or what it is that's actually transferred, we're actually going to be vying for the wrong thing, right? We're going to misunderstand what it is that God's actually trying to do in our lives. And so, Dad, I'm going to need your help for a second here. I got some money. I want you to pass out one bill to one person, whoever you, you know, this is yours to keep. Okay, so this is our father passing out money, just giving it away because he's a good dad. And Matthew's like, that's my allowance for coffee this week. I feel like the left side is highly favored of the Lord. <laughs> oh, he saved the big ones for the right side. I see. I see what happened here. <laughs> wow. Do you feel like Santa Claus, Dad? <laughs> yeah, it's a, especially because it's somebody else's money, right? <laughs> Pastor Pram, now you can take your wife out for coffee. Okay, Dad, I, I want you to keep going, though. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so what's happened here? What happened to the money? You ran out. Thank you, Dad. You did good. Santa Claus would be proud. Okay, we kind of think that way about the spiritual inheritance that we want to receive from our fathers, don't we? We feel, there's a couple things that we feel. We feel like there's somehow some kind of a limited supply, right? And also, we feel like there's certain people that are singled out and special and certain people that are going to miss out. So you got to kind of cozy up, try to build the relationship, right? Try to be in the inner circle, try to be the one that, 
the leader notices or the father notices because you don't want to miss out on the inheritance. But I don't want us to be confused about what the inheritance actually is. And if we go back to the very beginning, when God made a covenant with Abraham, if we can put that verse up in Genesis, Chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. The inheritance that Abraham was passing on from generation to generation wasn't his sheep, right? I mean, his kids got it for sure. But did everybody in Israel get a sheep? No. The physical stuff we have in limited supply. But what, what was actually the inheritance? What was the promise? What was the blessing that Abraham had to pass down from generation to generation? That God was going to make of them a great nation. See, the inheritance that we're receiving from our fathers is not a church planting strategy. Right? Right? The strategy for Philippines is different for Cambodia, different from Thailand, right? In Thailand, we kidnap people. We lock them up in church until they repent. <laughs> it's different. But what we're actually inheriting is the promise of a nation. And here's the thing about how spiritual inheritance works, is that you don't have to wait for the Father to pass it on to you to receive it. All you have to do is come into agreement with that vision and that purpose. So as long as you are in agreement with the vision and the purpose and you say, yeah, God, this is my vision, then you carry it. You get to carry it. And the other amazing thing about the inheritance and the vision that God gives us to pass on from generation to generation, we don't have to wait for them to die before we can walk in it. Right? Because a lot of times we think of this story, and Moses was dead. And then that's how Joshua's life begins, right? And so we're sitting on the edge of our seat. When is the guy going to go? <laughs> when am I going to be able to step into the fullness of my calling? Because that guy is still alive. <laughs> right? But the fullness of your calling doesn't begin the day that Pastor Rich and Pastor L go on to glory in their own chariot of fire, right? They're not going to experience death. They're just going to go up in some wild horse thing. <laughs> right? And, and the blessing is something that you get to possess today. You don't have to wait for your father to lay your ha his hand on you and say, I pass it on to you. Right? If they were going to give us sheep, we'd have to wait for that, and there'd be a limited supply. But the destiny and the blessing that God's placed on us as a family is he's called to make us a great nation. What God's promised us, what he's called us to, is to be a people that release the kingdom of God through planting churches in our nations. Amen? That's our inheritance. Okay? So we don't have to wait for anything special to happen. We don't have to wait for some baton passing ceremony to happen. You can pick it up today. Whether or not your leaders see it in you or not. Okay? So let's go to the story of Saul and, da and David in uh, 1 Samuel. This is after Saul was appointed by God to be the first king of Israel. He was what you would call the pioneer of kingship, right? In Israel, he was the first. And he was the guy that God picked out from among the crowd. I'm sure God picked out the best option. I'm pretty sure God didn't pick out the worst, right? There was a lot of good stuff in Saul's life, and so when God chose him, even though Saul wasn't wanting that position or necessarily vying to be king, God put him in that position. And then after some time, Saul began to misunderstand that his kingship was a position that he walked in instead of a job description that he was supposed to fulfill, right? I think Pastor Matt or Pastor Rich, somebody talked about that. Maybe it was that hard to keep it all together, right? That your calling is in a position. It's actually a job description. When you're called to be the apostolic leader, it's not a position in the church. It's actually a definition of what you do, right? And so that was 
Saul, he got confused because he thought that the position that God placed him in was actually a position and an authority and not a job description. So he stopped trying to serve the vision of the nation of Israel and he started trying to preserve his kingdom. Right? He moved into a position of protection. God has not called us to protect the kingdom. He's called us to release the kingdom. Right? And as soon as we move into protection, we take we overtake the authority that God's actually, that's God's job. That's his boundary. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in protecting, right, that we start manipulating, controlling, deciding, moving behind the scenes, because we got to protect this thing. God's called you to release it. Release it. We walk in wisdom, but God's going to be the one who protects it. He is building his church, Right? So we say here, now, so this is after Saul did not kill Goliath. He had 40 days to take up that opportunity, but he said no every day. He was the tallest guy. He was the anointed king, but yet he was waiting for somebody else to come along and do his job. So then David did. And then after that, it says, so David went out wherever Saul sent him. Who sent David? Was it the prophet Samuel? No. Who did David obey? Even though Saul wasn't walking fully the right way. As a son and a daughter, our responsibility is to obey our fathers. And as soon as we start to have an opinion about what's right and wrong about them, what we can follow and not follow, you're beginning to disconnect your heart. Because the same principle that applied to Saul also applied to David. David's job was to not make Saul the perfect father. David's job was to become the perfect son regardless of his father. And if you can get that into your heart, you will look over and get over a lot of things that you don't agree with. And God will be able to do something in your heart that softens your heart and changes you into somebody who he can use because you're not going to have an agenda. Right? You're not going to have a secret plan, you know? And the secret plan might not even be to take over the kingdom, but to just get other people to see how bad the king is. Right? The same way that God did not call Saul to protect the kingdom, God has not called us as sons and daughters to make our fathers perfect. And we're not perfect either, FYI. (laughs) Okay, so David went wherever Saul sent him, and he behaved wisely. This is another sign of a son and a daughter in the faith, is they behave wisely. Why? Because they're behaving according to the vision and the purpose, not according to the king. The reason why you operate the way that you do in excellence isn't because we just honor our fathers. It's because we honor the vision that God's given us. See, what we're following is bigger than any person, right? That's why when Pastor Alan, Pastor Rich you know, move on to glory when they're 200 years old, we're not going to build a monument. We're not going to have a golden statue of Pastor Al in front of the lighthouse. Because it was never about Pastor Al. It was only about what he carried because he was willing to say yes to that vision. And this is where succession, sometimes we get it so wrong, is because If we feel like succession is about what the person is passing on, we lose the fear of the Lord because what God has called us to is not to just plant churches. He's called us to establish his kingdom. It's his kingdom. And that's why I'm not going to mess with dishonoring my father because it's not about me dishonoring him. I'm dishonoring the kingdom. That's why I'm not going to mess with dishonoring my brothers and sisters, even if we don't see eye to eye, because I'm not going to dishonor the kingdom. See, God is bigger than the issue in my life and bigger than the issue in your life, as long as we keep our hearts connected to the purpose, the vision, the family. God designed it so that the only way we will grow the right way is through family. And we look at family and we go, man, this is not perfect right? Pastor Chris, he's almost perfect. He's 99.9% perfect. 
So how are we supposed to work together when there's that 0.01% that's not right? The how is family. The how isn't that Chris gets it right, Pastor Chris gets it right all the time. The how is not that you get it right. The how is that we never move out of relationship and we never move off the vision. Amen? And so we behave ourselves wisely like that guy. Can you have the verse again? Because we are operating according to the vision and the call, not according to our fathers, right? You get what I'm saying, right? And Saul set him over men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Another indication that you're walking in that sonship is that you are accepted. People see the authority on your life. They value your wisdom, right? They value what it is that you bring to the table, even Saul's servants. And sometimes we feel like, man, if my leader doesn't value me, then I got, I got nothing. That's not true. If you have influence in somebody's life, there you go, sonship. Even if the father doesn't always see it, right? Sonship. Okay, can we go to the next verse? This is a few verses later in Samuel chapter 18, 29. Saul became even more afraid of David, and he remained David's enemy for the rest of his life. Now, I thank God that our leaders are not our enemies, <laughs> right? It's a blessing to live with a great family. But here's the crazy thing about Saul. Saul decided that David was going to be the enemy. David didn't make him the enemy. In fact, when David had the opportunity to kill Saul, right, he said, my father, why would I do this to harm you? Don't you know I'm your son? David maintained that heart of a son, even though Saul was after his life and like literally trying to kill him. See, that's the heart attitude that we need to have. Because we're not just committed to a person. David wasn't committed to Saul because Saul was Saul. David was committed to the vision, and it didn't matter what happened in that process. He wasn't going to move off of that relationship. He wasn't going to let it go. And so I just, I really feel like what we need to do is just get kind of like a, what's the word? An agreement, a decision in our hearts that we are already carrying that inheritance, guys. We keep talking about passing the baton, and there's certain things that are definitely going to be, you know, systemized. There's going to be people that are going to be put in positions of leadership and stuff like that, but we all carry it right now. We all carry it right now. And how we honor each other and how we honor our fathers is how we're adopted into that vision. So there's a couple things that I just want to point out, things that I've seen in my own life that God's just been dealing with me about and maybe something that you can work on too. Okay? One of the things that we like to do when we kind of find um, that there's disagreement in our relationships is that we like to assume motives. Right? He disagrees with me. She disagrees with me because... And that's one of the things we have to root out. Because if we try to decide somebody's motive for them, it puts us in a position where we become critical of them. And any kind of criticism that we have, any kind of attitude of, I'm looking for faults, is going to take you off course, not them. And so in our relationships with each other, I don't have to be your best friend because what I have with you is deeper than that. I have covenant with you, right? I might not know when your birthday is or what your middle name is, but I have a deeper relationship with you than I do with a lot of friends that I have in Canada because I have covenant with you. I don't have covenant with them. And I don't have to spend, you know, every moment of my life talking to somebody in order to be in agreement with them. Like we have different levels of relationships, right? Different levels of deepness. 
but because I'm covenanted to you, I mean, we could be meeting for the first time today, but if you are in the vision and you are in the family, my relationship with you is deep. It's covenant, and it's not going to change. So we got to be careful that we're not assuming somebody's motive, okay? And in our relationships and wor working with each other, the other thing that we need to do is we got to make sure that we honor our differences. Honor our differences. I thank God that you guys aren't all like me. We would go crazy. We would. Because I move at the speed of fast. And we'd run into so many walls <laughs> after a while, right? It would just be way too much. Thank you, Jesus. Covenant relationships protect us from the pitfalls that other leaders face. You know, as leaders, there's always issues that we run into. It's our covenant relationships that are our greatest protection. So here are some things that, again, that we just want to be careful in our relationships, okay? Judging somebody's motivation, number two, is thinking that somebody owes you something because of what you invested in them. Sometimes we make this mistake as leaders, right? We feel that you owe me something because of what I've invested in you. We give, we release with, with no expectation of return. Because the second you feel that way, you will actually begin to control. And control will knock, control will kill relationships quicker than anything else. You know, it will. And so we got to be careful of that. Another thing is we have to be careful of wanting to do everything ourselves with, r rather than releasing those that we're called to empower because we can do it better. This one is really hard for me because I know I can do it faster for sure. <laughs> Maybe not better, but I can definitely do it faster. And one of the things that God's teaching me is I got to develop like deep roots of patience. Patience. We got to be so patient and let people grow at their pace. And we got to give them opportunities because if we take back those opportunities, we're going to be limiting them, okay? Here's another one. Be careful of being more concerned with how a job is being done than how someone is doing. Right? It's our relationships that matter. Okay? So as the next generation or whatever it is that we are, right, that's picking up the call of God on our lives, we have the fear of the Lord on our lives because we understand what it is that we're carrying. It's not Victory Churches. It's actually God's purpose for Asia. It's his purpose for our nations. We have to be careful that we learn how to pass that on to the next generation. <clears throat> this is my fear. Dad and Pastor Rich and all of you know our national leaders, they have such deep relationships. And as we grow, it's going to be a challenge to keep those relationships for us deep, right? Pastor Rich talked about that in the video. And my fear is that the next generation, we're not going to place the same emphasis and importance on the relationships because we'll rely on them to be the glue for us. But what we have to learn to be is the glue for each other. We have to learn to develop that connection, right? And the reason why we do things like pre-summit and summit and we go to each other's nations is because it's our responsibility. The one thing that we do carry that they cannot carry for us is how to deepen my relationship with you. I am going to commit to you the same way they've committed to each other. And I'm going to commit to you apart from their commitment to each other. I don't have to rely on Pastor Rich or Dr. L or anybody else, right? It's my responsibility. So that's my challenge for us today. I want us to pick up that responsibility to deepen our relationships with each other, the next generation. And we have to learn how to pass that commitment on to the next generation. 
We have to learn to teach the next generation, to teach the next generation, to teach the next generation. It never ends, right? And so if we don't want to mess up what God is doing here in Victory Asia, we have to deepen our relationships. God is raising up a company of people who are unbreakable in our relationships in the pursuit of advancing his kingdom. We will not continue to grow in the work without growing in our relationships. Because Victory Asia is only as strong as our relationships are. Amen? Amen.